Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from a wonderful light lunch. And uh, I hope we are feeling ourselves enlightened after this. And it means we are ready to continue our day. Before that, as a short uh, uh, team build ice break before that, Arnis, are you here in our studio? Yes, you are. Please stand up. You have a wonderful chance to the speakers of first part of they which are still here to give a nice Latvian presence uh, so the presents are here handshakes camera is not catching that so you can shake the hand really with enthusiasm and I'm asking here in front of course uh, the speakers from the first part of the day and we're gonna start uh, with uh, Robert Medlin please uh, please applause 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 uh, Gift time, gift time. Uh, Stephen Quest, of course, Stephen Quest. Uh, applause, applause, no exceptions. Elmars Gengers, Elmars Gengers, please, are you here? A gift from us. Uh, we continue. Uh, Miss Rowan, Miss Rowan, please, uh, are you here or you are already on our Baltic flying somewhere? or just in IT center, so you can keep it. You can send the gift through email. <laughs> okay. Uh, Margarida, Margarida, are you here? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Guna Paidere, Guna Paidere, definitely thank you from Latvians to Latvians. <laughs> Uh, John Kutstra, uh, John Kutstra, also thank you very much for your input and gift. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is something you can eat inside, the intrigue, intrigue. And uh, Marianne uh, Sorensen, uh, also thank you very much, Marianne, Marianne, already in Denmark, they are so fast. Uh, with digital movement and everything else. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And we are here to continue uh, our day. And our day we continue with uh, the second set, private and public cooperation for efficient public service delivery. We know the rules of the game already, so we're going to start with three, this time, 10 minutes presentations, and then we're going to switch over to panel discussion with the famous catch box. And we're going to start our short presentations in public-private field with Uldis Pabars, Chairman of the Board, Complete Payment Systems Latvia. Applause, please. Uh, Dear colleagues, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm happy to participate in this uh, uh, conference and I hope that uh, all we get something interesting from it, uh, what we can bring back home and implement uh, when, wherever uh, it is, uh, could be applied. <coughs> uh, today I would like to tell you about um, our, what our company together with other private partners, together with uh, public uh, partners, have achieved. And mainly, uh, it is uh, uh, about uh, transparency and especially in the management of public funds. <coughs> uh, by transparency, uh, I not only mean uh, what uh, data government uh, or municipality institutions uh, have. Uh, I mean uh, attitude change. It is, uh, uh, it is uh, let's, let's take an example. Uh, this is me, uh, and uh, I am aware that uh, government and municipal institutions know a lot of things about me. Uh, where do I live, uh, how old I am, uh, how much I earn, what taxes I pay, and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, 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 they know also my uh, social status. But the uh, question is, what do we know about on opposite, about uh, uh, government institutions and what data they have and how, how uh, how detailed information they know about us and uh, also about public services. 
uh, are they uh, transparent enough? Uh, we could take an example uh, uh, where uh, pu uh, example about public transport, and uh, public transport is uh, uh, usually <coughs> subsidized by state or municipality, and uh, those subsidies goes to, to uh, public transport uh, service providers. <coughs> Uh, what do you us what we usually know about uh, uh, public uh, transport companies? Usually, they what we hear from uh, paper, TV, papers, internet. Uh, that usually they are loss making. Uh, public service, uh, public transport service uh, companies are loss making. Uh, they do a lot of investment in infrastructure. They uh, buy new buses, tires, uh, fuel, cleaning stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, it's, uh, in most cases, it's all necessary, but uh, what does it cost? What about the money? Um, let's take uh, an example. Uh, here's an old man. It's not me yet, maybe in some 30 years or uh, later. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, this, uh, this person uh, most probably is uh, entitled for some uh, social uh, ben benefits, <clears throat> uh, and let's look how, how it's how it's how it's done uh, today. Uh, usually, uh, when the person is uh, buying a, a ticket, uh, some part of money comes from that person, and some. Part uh, in uh, in the sense of subsidies are paid directly to the uh, public transport company. Uh, this this situation uh, creates a, a quite big room for uh, conflict of interests uh, in in various levels. It is uh, it is uh, public transport company is interested in higher uh, volume of uh, subsidized uh, clients. Uh, not always exactly, uh, uh, in, uh, it is not exactly same amount what they have actually uh, served. Also, uh, if you look at lower level, uh, when it's a <coughs> point of sale, uh, there's a conflict of interest for, for uh, bus drivers as, as well, because uh, they are those ones who make decisions uh, whether such uh, uh, social status and uh, uh, should be applied for a uh, uh, concrete uh, a person. Uh, so it's it's a place for for uh, uh, this conflict of interest and also like temptation for 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 involved persons uh, to use it in their favor. Um, therefore, uh, what we are <coughs> uh, here comes our solution. And uh, it is a uh, change of uh, method how uh, public funds are applied for such uh, public services. What we have done, uh, uh, we have taken existing banking infrastructure. So it's at current point, it's uh, the best what we have at hand is contactless cards. Uh, in the future, it might be uh, mobile phone or whatever comes as a, a mean of payment. <coughs> uh, what uh, we we have applied uh, our solution, so it is in real time. So it it means that uh, subsidies are applied uh, at the moment when uh, uh, authorization or settlement of uh, uh, ticket purchase is done. It is available both offline, which is crucial for transport, as well as online for any other services, what's uh, necessary. And uh, as it is a uh, banking infrastructure, it, is, it uh, possesses all, all the elements of security what uh, banking infrastructure is, is uh, delivering. So it is not invented something new security. It, we are taking existing security levels what are in, in banking. Uh, what does it give us is that it, uh, at the uh, uh, 
subsidies are applied uh, at the moment when the actual transaction has happened. And uh, they, are, they could be, uh, uh, they are visible uh, at the reports what uh, bank is uh, supplying both uh, to uh, per, uh, person who is receiving service as well as a, a subsidy provider, which means that uh, they, they get all this uh, information uh, whenever uh, they look at their banking statements. And here comes this transparency. When we as a uh, client or user of public services and a person who is willing to uh, get as much information about public funds usage can, can do it through this uh, system, which means that both sides, uh, public service, uh, public funds holder and recipient has the same information. And they look at it from both sides equally and get a full picture how much the service costs and how much uh, subsidy has been applied. So, uh, <coughs> now uh, instead of uh, paying subsidies to uh, transport company, uh, the, our passenger gets uh, social benefit directly to his or her uh, personal bank account. And it happens when it, it, uh, he or she is buying a ticket. And uh, at the same time, uh, at the same time, um, uh, Full price of the ticket goes to bus uh, or, or other public uh, transport company, which means that they, they don't see any difference anymore uh, between subsidized and not subsidized uh, clients. Uh, and uh, they, they shouldn't know any, any information about social status of, of that person. Uh, people get control over their resources and also uh, resources which are passed over for uh, public administration. Um, yep. So, uh, I would like to conclude this with 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 some, some uh, with uh, with some uh, uh, points. <coughs> uh, first of all. With such solution, we can get transparency uh, on both sides, uh, public and private. And uh, we can, uh, when we talked previously about uh, di digitalization and digital de default, uh, here we can see an example where not always we have to uh, invent something totally from zero. We have a quite a lot of digital solutions already there, which could be uh, adjusted and applied to get the uh, most uh, value out of them, even in, in new new areas. As it, uh, it in this case, it's, it's uh, banking infrastructure has been used for public uh, uh, funds management. <coughs> and uh, another thing is that uh, what we have done. It's uh, we have tried to apply uh, things what you, you, uh, people are using already. It's uh, usual bank card payment. It means that there is no new habits to, to learn. People know how to use banking instruments. So by using them, they are already, already participating in uh, creation uh, control over public services. That's about it. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Uldis Pavars. Uh, you can take the break afterwards. You're going to come back and the panel discussion. And the next one we invite here is Hans Arendt uh, from Flemish e-government coordinator unit, Belgium. Uh, so the Belgium experience, uh, Mr. Arendt, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me at this conference. Uh, after all this talk yesterday at the SEMIC conference and this morning about pan-European frameworks and cross-border interoperability standards, I want to talk about a, a more modest effort at, at the Flemish 
local government level to develop uh, an interoperability standard together with, uh, with, the, with the business world, which will make it uh, easier, at least in Flanders, uh, to improve uh, local government uh, service delivery. So what were the goals we were trying to achieve? Uh, what we try to achieve is we realized, as most of you probably do, that local government is the first point of contact of most citizens and most enterprises. So all of us are busy developing portals at the national level and at the regional level, but in practice most citizens get in touch with their government at the local level. So that's why we at the regional government consider it one of our uh, main obligations to improve and enable these local governments to improve their uh, electronic service delivery. Uh, one of the big uh, problems they have there is to integrate with all the data services which we provide at the, at the regional and at the national level. As most of you know and as most, Belt and as most European countries are doing, uh, we also have a whole set of base registries and a whole set of services allowing you to access authentic data on persons, on businesses, uh, and to provide that data to local government. Uh, what we saw is that these local governments had the big uh, problems integrating with these data services. Typically, if you look, there are about 308 uh, municipalities in Flanders. Some are only 5,000 people big. Others are 200,000, 300,000 people. So there is a large disparity in how sophisticated these local governments are. So what we wanted to develop is a standard which makes it easier for local government to integrate with our national uh, data services. At the same time, we wanted to avoid, we wanted to avoid proprietary uh, solutions. Typically, there are about five software vendors who provide software solutions to local government. And typically, each software solution is a whole package of integrated uh, software. So once a local government chooses one of these software vendors, they're locked in for life. So what we wanted to have is a standard which would make it easier for local government to open up these software packages and to exchange data, not only inside their backend systems, but also between local governments. So we needed a, a data exchange standard which not only made it e easier to talk to, local, to uh, regional and uh, national government, but also made it easier for local governments to talk to each other because there is also a cross-border problem between local authorities. So what were the challenges there? What we saw is that uh, the one's only principle was failing in practice. Uh, we have solutions at the national level and at the regional level to support this one's only principle. We have these base registries, we have, have service-oriented architecture, we have the platforms necessary to exchange data within regional government and between regional government and national government, but these solutions are typically too heavy and too sophisticated to be used by local government. So what we saw is that this once only principle of you only give your data, need to give your data once, was failing at the local level. People had to re enter their information at the local level because the local level was unable to get authentic data from uh, the regional or the national level. Uh, another problem was that in order to access the data services, they typically had to go to very expensive integration efforts. These software products which are, uh, which are delivered by these software vendors are typically very closed products. So they only integrate with software packages of the same vendor and not with software packages of another vendor, let alone that they integrate easily with the service that we provide at uh, the regional or national level. So it was crucial in the development of our standard to get these software vendors involved. Now you may ask yourself, how do you do that? Because it's actually uh, against their better uh, judgment to uh, get involved. Well, what we did is first of all, convince their salespeople so we convinced their salespeople that by opening up their data packages, their software packages, it would be easier to integrate not only inside the back end of a, of a local government, but it would also allow local governments to follow a best of breed approach. Instead of selecting only software from one particular vendor, a local government would be able to pick and choose software packages from different software vendors. So as long as these software packages were better in functionality or better in price, that was going to 
enable them to sell more of these software packages. So that was the first thing we did, convince their salespeople. And we were so successful in doing so that they even invested uh, 5,000 euros each in the creation of the, of the standard. Then we had to get the uh, technical people involved and that was a lot easier to convince them because these technical people typically are already convinced of the value of open standards and interoperable standards. Uh, they are even eager to uh, open up their, their packages because that makes life simpler for themselves when they have to integrate their software packages with the software package of another vendor or with, uh, uh, or with the back-end system of a local government. It's easier to do so if you have to follow one and one standard only and not a multitude of uh, standards. Now, how did we design the standard? Uh, we did not design a standard uh, top-down, so not an all-encompassing abstract data model. We started bottom-up, so from starting from uh, real data exchange problems. For example, at the national level, we have uh, the Crossroads Bank of Enterprises, which tracks the whole life cycle of an enterprise from its creation to uh, its, its merging with a different company, to its bankruptcy. This is information which is not only uh, important to know at the national, at the regional level, but also at the local level. Certainly, if we can localize this information, if we can tell to a local government what enterprises are located on your, in your territory, that's important for a local government, not just for tax purposes, but also for developing their local government economic policy. So one of the first uh, uh, data objects which we modeled was actually businesses. A second thing which we modeled was contact information because typically uh, the, the, the address information which you get from the national level is the official address of a person, not the address where he actually lives or not the address where he actually wants to be contacted or we don't know what his email address is or we don't know whether he prefers to be contacted by mobile phone. So this is contact information which we typically do not have as authentic data at the regional or at the national level, but which is uh, very essential at the, at the, at the uh, local government level. So we started from these real data exchange problems to uh, model these uh, data objects in our data standards. This was done in multidisciplinary working groups with experts coming from these uh, uh, software vendors, but also experts coming from research, research which was important because we wanted uh, to have a, a data standard, which is not your typically, I, I give you a number of uh, XML schemas and that's it. We wanted to have a data format and an exchange standard which was more intelligent than that. So we used a number of semantic web technologies, uh, for example, resource description formats, so that we could model our uh, data exchange format in a more intelligent way, which made it easier for the software vendors to map their internal data formats as it's being used in the software pack packages into the data exchange uh, format which we developed. Now what's the result? Uh, the result is what we call Oslo, which is Dutch for Open Standards for Linked Administrations, and we basically model uh, three domains uh, which are important for local government. It's persons, businesses, and also location information. Um, the standard which we developed is uh, compliant with the ISA core vocabularies. Uh, a number of people from the ISA unit were even involved in the, a number of uh, meetings of our working groups. So we made sure that, these, uh, that our own vocabulary is compatible with these uh, ISA core vocabularies. What you can see is that um, some of the information comes from the base registries, so, but not all of the information. There's a lot of data items which are only captured at the, at the local level, but which are nevertheless important to, to model and to be able to exchange between local government. Uh, there is even a demand now for this local enrichment to be fed back to the national level so that we can enrich the information which we have, for example, uh, about persons with uh, information about uh, contact information. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the standard, uh, you can find more information at uh, the URL which you see mentioned there. I have to warn you though, uh, the standard is in Dutch, so you'll, uh, so you'll need some Dutch in order to understand the standard. But that was a, a key decision which was made from the very beginning, that we were not going to make yet another English standard, but a standard in Dutch, because this standard has to be able to be explained uh, by, and used by the business people. So if 
the terminology which is being used in the standard has to be compatible and has to be, you know, has to be uh, easy to use by the business people. That's why most of our standards for data exchange uh, are in Dutch. What we're doing now is uh, developing the mapping for uh, basically translating the Dutch terms into English terms, which is uh, relatively easy to do since we are compatible with these uh, Isaac core vocabularies. What are the next steps we're taking now? We've spent two years developing this standard. What we're now doing is we have uh, defined a clause which can be used in calls for public tenders. So local governments who want to force their software vendors to use this standard can simply insert a clause in the call for tenders demanding that their software product or the, the, the software they're developing as part of a project has to be compatible with this Oslo standard. So that's a very uh, uh, strict way of enforcing the use of the standard. Uh, for the time being, uh, we're uh, relying on a volunt voluntary conformance testing. So we expect that these software vendors test their software to see whether it's compatible with this Oslo standard. Uh, to be honest, we're already noticing that some of these software vendors are a bit, let's say, too optimistic about the compatibility of their software. So we will probably be introducing a more formal conformance testing protocol where we as a regional government will define a number of use cases so that we can test their software uh, with respect to the compliance to this standard and then they will get their software will get a certificate of compliance and only if they have the certificate of compliance uh, their software can be used by a uh, local government. Now local government has to be convinced also to use this standard so we've set aside uh, money to uh, have some pilot projects where this standard is actually being used as part of a specific project so that local government can feel and see for itself that using an, an open standard is to their benefit and uh, also reduces cost in developing uh, their uh, e-government service project. And that's okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hans Arendt's uh, e-government Flemish perspective. I believe that this is going to be quite interesting in panel discussion because uh, we are speaking about cross borders and opening and here's ha Dutch quite quite nationally uh, focused and driven and uh, but that's in the panel session to complete our second set of presentations I'm kindly asking here uh, uh, Oily Pekka Rissanen, Public Sector ICT, Ministry of Finance, Finland. Uh, another Scandinavian Nordic experience, please. Yes. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here to speak after the lunch. And <laughs> in the case that you are going to fall in sleep, I explain very shortly what I'm going to speak about. I'm going to speak about the feelings of the civil servants. And maybe this is going to surprise you that civil servants also have feelings. <laughs> uh, but I, my case is e-identification in Finland. It's, it's going to be only the framework, so I am not going to concentrate on that very closely. What, what is the all details in the, our e-identification? Um, our e-identification has based on PPP from late 90s. And, and the same IDs are, e IDs are used in, in the public and private sector services. There are three different methods. NetBank IDs are, has a monopoly in, in practice in Finland. Mobile ID have a small share and public uh, national ID card is almost zero. And same time, we have uh, thousands of bilateral agreements. It's so-called three-corner model. And I'm, 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 I'm using this, that this is not a real public-private partnership. It's more like public, private, and pay. Because we have an agreement and we pay for these private uh, service providers about the uh, e-identification. It's not a real uh, partnership today. Because they have set their own rules and we follow these rules and, and of course, these agreements and so on. But it's, it's, and then the payment, but nothing else. If you, have, you, if you are married uh, or you have been married, you know the difference of this kind of <laughs> marriage and <laughs> real partnership. 
<laughs> but <laughs> but in, in national, the one detail here is that in national policy, there is a national policy, not a le legislation, that all uh, these service providers are using uh, this popular register identification and common ID number. But it's not in a law, but it has been in practice. Now we are in a new approach. We are changing that game. We are, basing, uh, based, we are going to based on open four corner model. Uh, if you are using a Visa card or MasterCard, you know the system that you can use your card here in Latvia and your, your money is gone from your account in, in Finland. And so these are the players, there are four corners, two banks, uh, we as a customer and a Latvian shop. So this is the same idea here. But what are our objectives here in is that we have an open, fair competition and less these bilateral agreements because it has been a mess. And it has to be very clear for e-service providers how they can buy the service uh, to offer. The, these e-service providers can use e-identification in a very simple way. That was the one. And the one and crucial thing is that citizens can use the same e-ID for business and government services or public sector services, all, all services, they can use the same EID system. Because typically people are using much more, example, the net bank than, than, than government services. And this is a direct, we want to go that, no more services. And now we have been in stagnation in Finland that there have been no new technologies, but uh, just last week there was announcement of a couple of two new technologies uh, and this is one of our approaches. And now we are put on the regulation that e EID will be based on population registry infant identification. But how we are building up this partnership? We are using law, we are using a government decrees, we are using a common agreement for, for all the partners and some bilateral agreements. And the government is involved only for, for three of these first. Of course, we are not involved in bilateral agreements between the different stakeholders. It's uh, open. And so we are, hope that we are going to have a less administrative burden. And this is real public partnership. But part of this story, this process, how we have done during the last year to change that system, it was not easy because what we have to do is that we do it together. It's not so bad the government or, 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 or civil servants are saying that this is the way it works and when you follow. Of course, to be honest, we do it together, but we have a, that legislation is like a stick back, uh, behind your back so you can say that yes, um, if you don't agree, we are going to use a legislation. Of course, there was a little bit this kind, of, but mostly we, we, we didn't have only formal openness. It's not enough. We, are, we, we open it really that uh, process. And here comes the feelings of the civil servant. This is my comfort zone here. If I move like this, I feel a little bit more in discomfort. And if I have to go here, I'm Finn. I have to go here, where the center of this podium. I, I feel very <laughs> the Finnish way I'm speaking like. <laughs> and this, this was our feeling when we opened it, that discussion with all the private partners, because they, they really, um, um, aggressive is not the right word maybe, but they, they really didn't uh, accept us as a partner in the beginning. So that they didn't believe that we are really open. They didn't believe that we, are, we have some hidden agenda there, that we are building up some national ID card, and, and this is done, something on, on, the, on the, that. And so these, um, we civil servants, when we are building up real partnership, we have to go to the discomfort zone, because um, we don't know exactly, I, I, I suppose so, that we don't know exactly what is the um, 
uh, how the business is going on and how the business is, how the business people think. We are civil servants and we are looking for that. But here, example in this case, we have to think who is going to benefit from the, this. Of course, the government is going to benefit. I hope that the EID providers is going to benefit, but the most benefit is going to citizen and e-service providers. And I think that's the reason we could move from the comfort zone to discomfort zone. That's the only reason. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, absolutely right, you can stay in your discomfort zone and sit, sit down and other people are joining you. I'm asking again on the stage right now, all these Pabers, please, uh, and Hans Arendt also joining, joining. And uh, as uh, other team players in the field, uh, we are asking Aldis Willums, Solutions Architect, uh, WW Public Sector Services, Microsoft Europe. Uh, applause, round of applause. Uh, Ingemar Spotis, Vice President, Member of the Board, Limited Liability Company, Latvia's Mobilized Telephones, Latvia. Applause to Ingmar Spotis. And the third one was planned, Janis Bokta, Chief Executive Officer, State Joint Stock Company, Latvian State Radio and Television Center, Latvia. He is not here because he has a nice happening precisely now in family. He is becoming father uh, or the child is coming and uh, I believe the child and, and conference, uh, it's hard to decide of course, but uh, he, took, he took a chance uh, on the child. Well, the wife will be satisfied from that I believe. And it means that uh, you are a minority. <laughs> in this particular moment, and uh, we are increasing uh, uh, the gaming in, uh, in, our, in our field. We have uh, three new two newcomers. We're going to start because I have some kind of energy link with, uh, with uh, Mr. Ingmar Spoutis, so I am giving you the catch box and uh, of course, a uh, short, uh, short comment about what is happening around and are you happy about this? Because we know that public service, they have a feelings. <laughs> Do have a feelings also entrepreneurs. So please. Oh my God, we have lots of feelings, lots of feelings. And uh, it's, so, it's so nice to realize that uh, these uh, feelings are on both sides and probably something beautiful might, might uh, stem from this. But, uh, Listening to previous and also to uh, previous session as well, uh, I had some sort of a deja vu because I have been listening to that sort of discussions in a, in a uh, telcos sector for many, many years. And, and the questions of we have created a beautiful service and no one is using it and how to make them use it and um, so forth and, uh, and so on. And what we have came to realize and I have been also listening here that this realization is uh, coming also to this much more complex system of, of uh, government is that uh, feelings and uh, humans are, and, and human, uh, <laughs> human feelings are probably most important part because if the system has to be nice, it has to be likable and it has to be simple and uh, probably uh, I, I, I would totally agree with uh, many speakers here that uh, I guess that the ecosystem and, uh, and, and, and the playground for uh, public and private partnership has to be uh, set forth by the, by the government. And so these, um, these things would be open and, and I, th I, I guess the private sector might give a very good hand to actually uh, uh, make these services needed and make them simple and, and probably liked e even, I guess. So. Okay, thank you for... That's my feelings. Uh, yes, we are now giving to all this uh, possibility because he's also first time today on this stage. So your opening remarks for our public session. Okay, so I'm representing a big company. Of course, we are you know, partnering with many governments, actually many, many governments around the world. 
and the partnering, although we are a technology company, at the core, you know, there's a different levels. We are helping in education. This is the people part of the problem, so making sure uh, that people get educated in, in the way of you know, using technologies. Uh, for example, we are currently in library building, so we were partnering with the Tresha Stavdals program uh, to help uh, educate people, get them uh, into the technologies. Uh, this is just one example. Another example is during the work, for example, I am doing, uh, working with multiple customers around Europe, Middle East, and Africa, is actually of bringing those experiences to different, from different customers to other different customers and helping them to plan their roadmaps. But now, going specifically in maybe technology area, what I see as a big problem, and, and some of these things already were mentioned during the previous talks, is this difference between what uh, commercial customers are doing and what uh, uh, public sector customers are doing. We know that there has been this lag always, you know, in public sector, I would say. Again, there are, of course, some exceptions. But now, uh, with the advent of new things that are coming, uh, you know, again, technology uh, speak, you know, big data things, cloud things, uh, the, the rapid iteration cycles that we have uh, are causing, I think, even bigger disconnect here. And I think one of the big problems we need to solve, and maybe this is also something that we can discuss and maybe learn from the experience of others, is, is how we can make sure that uh, commercial guys are not kind of shooting away with very innovative solutions on some of these new technologies, new platforms, uh, leaving the public sector dealing with you know, the, the typical things they're doing now. Buying infrastructure, caring about the infrastructure, you know, and, and, and actually spending a lot of effort and money on things that maybe others are not spending money at all anymore. So gonna, that's kind of opening for some discussion as well. Okay, and that particular moment we have a, a chain of good questions that came here in. Together with the questions, one lady in the audience said you are doing sport in front of us like team games, so here you go, take this. Uh, to make some sportic noises. I don't know why this lady is bringing something like that around and everyday agenda, quite specific. But anyway, to wake up, uh, <laughs> you, uh, we are doing this right now. And the first question is, uh, um, that's quite, quite interesting. Uh, no habit changes of people. We want to change the environment, but the, we don't want to change ourselves. Is this possible? Again, philosophy, and I believe in the movie Avengers Age of Ultron, there is the main title in, the, in, the, in, in this trailer that you want to change the world, but don't want to change. So what about this? Is, this? is this really possible to lead the process from the top and, and leave the people that, I believe you said that no need to change habits. Let's, let's do everything with no habit changes. Please, yes, drop or, 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 or say, quick yeah. comment from our side. Mm -hmm. So one of our lead uh, UX researchers at Microsoft, what he's saying, he said that there is such a thing which is called God's, God's law. And, and unfortunately, it's almost constant, right? The, the innovation amount that person can take, it's unfortunately constant. So definitely we as technology vendors need to invent the ways of how we all that great innovation that kind of over exceeds that, you know, God's law line, mm -hmm. you know, that we bring it back to the people. So I think this definitely is a task for all, all of us. Okay. Uh, people usually, when you bring something new to them, uh, as, uh, as it was mentioned before, it's uh, first is, no, I don't want to change anything. Uh, uh, and that we have learned also in, 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 in our experience that the, uh, you cannot introduce something new and expect that it will be uh, taken away and used by everybody within a <coughs> week, month, year. It takes several years to get used. It uh, should, uh, you should uh, remind, teach people how to use things and when they get used to them, they think already, oh, that's what I have been already using or everybody around has been using uh, around me. So it takes uh, quite a lot of time to, to change uh, people's attitude. Yeah. Therefore, you start with things what they know and change from that. Okay. Sounds quite manipulative, but <laughs> good. Uh, the Finnish experience. Uh, can I comment? Yes, thanks. Mm. Uh, yes, what's the question okay. about the people or civil servants? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I think that people can change and civil servants can change as an individual. But when we are speaking about organization, 
uh, 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 like some agency, the change is much more difficult. We are, we are very good changers when we are changing our, have, uh, how we use the technology and, 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 and everything like that. But when we are going to the organizational level, we are saying that this is not possible. Okay, yeah. okay, the fair but, answer. But fair. people can change, people are changing all the time. So your, your slogan is like a bit opposite, you, we have to change the people. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, it means 1-1. One, one. <laughs> okay. You can drop back now. Wonderful. I, I want to come back a little bit to this commercial versus public sector thing, because the, the problem is, and why I think the organizations will have to change for sure, right, and the way they serve customers is that people now are used to how they receive services from commercial uh, companies, right? Uh, and again, they are using all these, you know, public nice services that update all the time, that they are fresh all the time, new, new capabilities are coming all the time. And, and this is, I think, where the, a lot of force probably will come, you know, towards the public sector is to say, why can't you do something similar? So, so this is, again, the, the, the problem is how, how do we solve this in public sector to make sure that this innovation or at a rapid pace is possible. Uh, but, but will have to change because of that pressure, I think. Okay, we are switching to the next. Oh, I have to do that in the middle. <laughs> okay, now we are switching to the next. And that's quite provocative, in fact. Uh, forget about cross borders. <laughs> like, whoa. Well. Uh, maybe we should, oh, that's good, that may be, maybe we should uh, maintain only local solutions. They will be delivered better, closer to people, more understandable. How can you comment that? I believe the roots are coming out from uh, your perspective, that, yeah. that Dutch system. The Belgian, Belgian system. Belgian system. Yeah. Oh, we speak Dutch, but... Yes, you can call me Lithuanian. <laughs> 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 Please. Uh, no, it's important to realize, as I argued, that most service delivery takes place at the local level, but most, uh, for most of these services, information is needed, which comes from the regional or, or, or the national level. Eh? Mm -hmm. And indeed, if people start moving from country to country or just live uh, uh, next to the border of a country, you, you quite frequently are, are, are confronted with the need of exchange of data across borders, and then you inevitably uh, need standards in order to be able to exchange data between countries. So I would argue that uh, your, your front end or your, your customer facing part of your services has to be at the local level, but there has to be a whole machinery behind it at the regional level, at the national level, at the European level to enable this seamless service delivery at the local level. Okay, very good. To whom you pass, uh, I, I saw that Ingmar is reacting lively. Yes, I do. Actually, we have seen this same discussion going on in uh, the telecommunication part, because if you look from the, from, from, from the central perspective of whole Europe, it, it might seem that uh, cross-border thing is the most important one. But however, we, what we see is that people don't actually travel that much. And they, 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 if we think of priorities, that's always the first priority is, let's say, make your house tidy and make the things in order in, in, in your own uh, place. And actually, probably the first priority on, on cross-border part would be to make it easier for companies to cooperate on, uh, in, on pan-European uh, level rather than actually uh, do this for, for, the, for the people. Actually, people will follow the, the services of these companies probably and not uh, probably vice versa, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, please pass the cube. Coming back to, the, to the, the fact that actually many European countries and actually the countries outside of Europe are actually building very similar things, right? Uh, the, the priorities are very similar. Again, me traveling around, seeing different things. Uh, I think, yes, you know, at the, you know, from endpoint uh, perspective, probably we need to prioritize the local countries, but definitely there is a lot of reuse potential across uh, European Union and also other, um, uh, other countries even. So I think there needs to be this balance of prioritize implementation locally, but definitely reuse things uh, that are defined somewhere else, somebody who has done a good solution somewhere else, so try to reuse at least the concepts, if not the actual implementation. Okay, thank you, and please pass the cube to Oli, because the next question is addressed directly about Finland. And I absolutely agree with the idea that chance for success have only e-ideas that are used uh, 
hot or not, I cannot understand, only for public services. But uh, what about internet banking? Can you elaborate further Finland's experience in cooperation with banks in EID area? Or banks and EID, can you elaborate this? Yes, <clears throat> I think that uh, because of the role of the banks has been so strong in, in, in e-identification in Finland, so we can say that our all e-government development has been uh, because the banks are offering this EID. And so, and, but I, I can say that the cooperation has been very nice, but of course when you, somebody is in a monopoly position, so it makes sometimes this so-called partnership more difficult, <laughs> dominated <laughs> partner, <laughs> dominating partner. And so there have been a lot of problems like this, uh, so that banks are taking the very strong role. Can I use the possibility to have one comment here about this public-private cooperation in general? Because I think that this has been on our agenda for a very long time, and we have, uh, but, and, and we have different kind of thoughts about that. But I think that the one word, a game, is going to change the rules of the game, and that's the. Uh, Digitalization, <laughs> because it's a change. It's, it's a change in all the all, how we are using information and how how these people are, as you say, that how the people see the different uh, services and so on, and and, and, and what is happening behind this in the back office and everything is going to change. And so I believe that this pub, public or private cooperation has has, has, has uh, something very diff different forms in a couple of years because the development is very fast. The world is changing together with... Yes, or we can try to, in the public sector, we, try, we can try to build up the walls around us to protect us from, 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 from this change, like case Uber. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, additionally, my compliment to you, I like that you are uh, raising the question, can I ask or can I tell about something, and then you answer yourself, yes, yeah, yes. and then you continue. <laughs> that is the finish after midnight, I believe. Uh, very good. Uh, the, next, uh, the next question is coming out, in fact, what you are describing, and the question is, contactless uh, uh, transparency, attitude change, but isn't it maintaining ignorance of citizens? With, I believe the underlining here is that if we are absolutely, well, like public service, serving to the citizens, giving everything, they are not thinking enough anymore and just taking the service. That's the question, not mine. So, answer. Me. Ah, no, you can, you can pass yes, this I time. Yes, I do that. Yeah, wonderful chance. Oh, lucky one. <laughs> I, I think we, we should not underestimate the, 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 the intelligence of the general, general public. Mm -hmm. If we see how uh, intelligently they already use open data, or if, if for example, the UK government uh, provides information on how they spend their budget, and people uh, do investigative journalism on, on what we do with their taxpayers' money, I think uh, uh, we have to brace ourselves for, for more transparency than we, can, uh, than we can cope with. So we should certainly continue this movement towards openness uh, and, and, and prove to people that we are providing value for money. Eh? Okay, it's becoming more transparent, in fact, and we are living in, in better society from day to day. Uh, from philosophy perspective, well, we're, we're, we're telling them that we have uh, less and less money to provide services. We have to make clear where our priorities are so that they can, they can either uh, uh, approve our choices or not approve our choices. Eh? That's also the reason why I see this pri private-public cooperation, this balance changing in the future, because we as governments will sometimes have to make very tough choices and say to people, either we cut your social security benefits, but we still provide certain electronic service, or we do not provide certain electronic service anymore, but you still get your social security benefits. But we, as long as we provide a platform where, where, where private companies can still provide services on top of our platform, we still can deliver the services that they expect, but we'll have to make some tough budgetary choices in the future. That's something I certainly see happening uh, at my national level. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, yes, yeah. comment? Uh, I think definitely kind of th this is a very important point I want to kind of stress uh, once again. So 
e-services are not necessarily just, you know, for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, it makes life easier potentially, you know, for the actual users of them. But, uh, you know, the problems that uh, e-services uh, are intended to solve uh, also go into the, these deeper levels. Like uh, electronic health care, that is close to my heart as well, you know, so this is the kind of in, in industry, I think there is an agreement at the moment that uh, the, the way to solve the, the burden for the health payments at the government levels is to go this e-health um, e way and to use some of these advanced technologies to keep people out uh, with some technology help uh, out of the hospitals. So that's important. I, I like how you said that uh, e-health is close to my heart. <clears throat> well, definitely. Ingmars has something to say. Uh, also, a little reference to, to the... Uh, it always becomes easier to, to develop a new service if you can philosophically answer to the question, would the world be a better place uh, with this new service? Because there is no reason to, uh, you know, build a church of uh, digitalization just to pray and make all things digital. There, no one needs it and no one needs your digitalization if it uh, makes more friction and if it makes your the previous service harder to use. So just don't spend zillions of euros just to make it digital, it's unnecessary. But if it makes things faster and it saves some time and, or understandability or gives some transparency, which is probably a, a great point, then, then there is a reason. There always has to be a reason for becoming digital, I think. Okay, thank you. The last question from my side, yes, here, and then we're going to drop the catch box in the public. How uh, you are speaking on... Uh, access to data from, from level to level, national, supranational, etc. How access to data is going together with data safety? We are entering cloud era, how you are considering cloudy solutions. I don't know what this really means, but cloudy solutions uh, on the ear, it's like, uh, well, smells fishy. <laughs> cloudy solutions uh, in the context and uh, data safety at all. So who is keen to start answering? You can start in Mars, in fact, and then you pass the queue. Thank you. Well, I think uh, data security, what we have seen, is uh, uh, one of the first products you could actually really sell to big corporations in the, in the, in the smartphone, uh, let's say, uh, era, because everything goes mobile, is actually uh, mobile device management uh, uh, solutions, which we are uh, trying out here, because this there is no borderline anymore, because the your employees are walking around with the smartphones at their private time and at their job, if they are in the bank or wherever, it's always not secure, because therefore the evolution does its part. Uh, therefore, there is all all new sets of services that you can actually use as a, as an employer to actually limit the use of smartphones at work. This is probably a, a very uh, mundane example, but I believe that uh, uh, evolution will be beautiful also on the security part, also on the, on the government side. I know. Okay, and passing the cube. Yes, please. Just a just comment. I don't understand this discussion at all. How <laughs> we can see that the cloud is a reason to risk data protection? It's, it doesn't make sense for me. Well, it's logical. It's... Uh, because it's a cloud, and so we can, and it's something new, so we can Scary. risk. Scary. Yes, Scary <laughs> so cloud. we can risk the data protection. Well, no. once we had here the conference on the e-security, and at the end of the day, after five hours of talking about clouds or machines <laughs> on the spot, <laughs> the idea was the cloud is wonderful, it's perfect, it's safe, but you have to make a copy in machine. So, <laughs> anyway, anyway, yes. Uh, <laughs> Open question, definitely open question. Uh, someone else, yes, please, the short comment, and then we are switching to the public. Presenting here one of the three hyper-cloud uh, no, providers. Um, I think I should say that uh, security definitely is the top of the minds, top, top, of, top concern for many customers that we're working, both commercial and also public sector, of course. But this is also the, the reason why we are investing heavily on making sure that there are no you know, problems, glitches uh, in the whole process. Uh, one thing that we are pioneering also is the various standards uh, towards the cloud uh, information, cloud-based information protection, right? And so, so effectively, at the end of the day, uh, this is, you know, the set of mechanisms that we have, and then your trust in the fact that, you know, we are implementing them uh, properly, and, and we have, we have, you know, various audits to prove it, uh, prove it, also certifications. 
So uh, I think with time, uh, you know, people will just see that it's, it's kind of the same if it's a cloud data center, if it's your local data center, at the end of the day, it's kind of the same concepts there. So, okay, you know. and this particular moment, I'm taking the chance of moderator, because we are a bit running out of time, so one drop in public, only one pass in public right now, who gonna be exclusive one, who gonna take this cube, one by one, not all together. <laughs> okay, then I'm just dropping to this gentleman who is writing email to his mom. Uh, okay, be careful. Oh, and we killed Invisible Man. Uh, anyway, at your legs there is a cube, so you are absolutely privileged to raise the question, if you have one, or just to say a comment, or just to wish us happy year 2015. Please. Of course, I wish a happy day Thank and you. Um, um, greetings to participants and um, it's um, private, public, um, it means um, cooperation in, in different levels and uh, I like uh, um, all these pubers who said about this transparency and uh, do we know each other, public, about private and private about public. Um, is it hope to know each us uh, better in, in the future? Maybe know data, more data, more um, um, open data, uh, and um, um, more cloud-based uh, uh, solutions or different others? Is it the um, right way? Thank you for continuing uh, what Oli said about this happy marriage. Uh, are the open data within this marriage of public-private solution just getting knowing each other more and more? Uh, I think uh, it is uh, uh, from both sides <coughs> should be de defined how, of how far can you, can you go. Uh, uh, from, from public side, uh, Private should should know where our funds are, are, are has been used. Me as a person, I, I should know uh, if I'm entitled to some some, uh, some uh, funding from uh, state or local municipality, and how much I, I actually ha ha have got. Uh, because from other side, state already knows about everything about me because I am uh working uh, paying taxes and uh, all this information is already with state so i think it's uh as other, other side more now should be opened and uh yep okay thank you Hello. please uh, yeah i think actually open data is i would treat it open data as a contract actually between the public and the and the private right the open data is a mechanism that enables private guys to party on top of the data to develop derivative solutions, uh, do some investigative ju journalism, so many things like that. So I think that, that's probably the, the, the benefit, the main benefit of open data. Uh, also, of course, the benefit of open data is the fact that then governments don't have to build the user interfaces necessarily themselves. They can rely on these third parties to kind of party on the data and do things. And there are good examples of open data usage. In our experience, actually, the interesting thing is that local authorities are the first ones that are doing it. We have you know, cities like Barcelona, London, Glasgow that are publishing open data. And a lot of derivative assets have been created for the benefit of the citizens and tourists in those cities. Thank you. Uh, on the partnership and how to increase the eff efficiency of partnership. The last concluding remarks and then we are going in the break again. Ingmar's maybe some... Oh, he was keeping the mic in the pocket so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's another mic. No, I, I, I still uh, probably one final remark is uh, uh, to be human and, uh, and, and to see some reason for being more, even more human uh, whatever you do in uh, digitalization, I guess. Okay, be more human, uh, please, Belgium. Uh, well, I think to achieve efficiency, we, we indeed need to, to work together, uh, private and public uh, enterprises, so that we can deliver the services that the, the citizen expects from us. Working together, thank you, and maybe from Oli. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's the microphone coming. Oh, you have, you have already. Okay, <laughs> I have now two, <laughs> it's better. Uh, and, and 
I, I, I believe that when we start to look from, from the citizen side or customer side, when, when we look at the services, when it's, it's a good start to think how we can have a better public-private cooperation, not starting from us, but starting from the citizen. Starting from citizen. Yeah. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please, huge applause to our <laughs> second panelist. And, of course, uh, Ardenis is coming on the stage and giving gifts now. The gifts are there, yeah, yeah, they are behind, don't be afraid, they are there. Not, <laughs> they are. And uh, the gifts from uh, organizers to our speakers. And we are going to short coffee break, 25 minutes coffee break, and then we continue with a wonderful experience of Estonia. And then we continue with the final panel session. Thank you very much, uh, coffee break. <laughs>